guys, welcome to the Vertical Life Church online experience. I'm Kelly and I'm so excited to welcome you to our global community. We want to awaken and empower you in your walk with Jesus. And so we're going to bring you some powerful worship and an awesome message. Check it out. How are you guys doing tonight? Good. That's my mom. Hey, mom. How are y'all doing tonight? Yeah? Good. So when you walked in, you probably saw some communion on your seat. We're going to get started tonight with communion. And uh, we might do it just a little bit different than, than usual. And uh, so you go ahead and grab that right now. Just have that in your hand. Have that ready. You can even peel off that little top layer so you're ready to go. You know, when I think about communion, there's a story that always comes into my mind. And it's a story of Jesus healing a paralytic. And so he's in the synagogue with all these religious people. And he makes this statement. He says, your sins are forgiven. And all these people, like, get mad and start asking all these questions. And Jesus, in only the way that Jesus can, he comes up and he says, what's, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise, stand up and walk? So that you would know I have power to forgive sins. Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. And what Jesus is foreshadowing and showing is that the covenant that he has come that we are able to enter into that covenant is a dual covenant he gave his body and his blood he gave his body so we could be whole healed we could be saved that word sozo we talk about it a lot his body was broken so yours and mine could be made whole and his blood was shed so we could be forgiven from our sin and made righteous in his sight. It's a dual covenant. And so what we're gonna do right now, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you, go ahead and take the body. And Father, we just come before you in this place right now and we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, that you went through hell on earth. Your body was broken so that ours could be made whole we believe it in faith we take this bread right now believing that our wholeness is on the other side of your broken body we say yes we declare healing in this place right now tonight by the broken body of Jesus healing in this place we declare physical healing right now in this place over anyone that needs it not only physical healing, but spiritual healing. We thank you that spiritually blind eyes would open right now in this place. That spiritually deaf ears would open right now in this place to see you and hear you and know you. We thank you, Jesus, your body was broken and we receive everything that you paid for right now. In the same way, you can go ahead right now and you can take the juice. And Father, we say thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you, Jesus, for the new covenant that you came and paid for so we could know you, so we could be near to you, so we could be full of you, so that we would be righteous in your sight, cleansed from everything that we have done in our past. We say yes to your new covenant where you say all that I am is yours so we say all that we are is yours tonight. We are yours. We are here for you tonight. And we say yes. Holy Spirit, come in this place. It's all for you, Jesus. It is all for you, Jesus. We say yes to you. Yeah. 
together forever this is the truth it's i am yours through faith i'm yours and you are mine i get you every time and we'll be together forever no more separation because i revelation that he just wants to just stamp on our hearts tonight that we didn't have to do anything to earn it nothing to deserve it oh but his blood oh it covers all and we finally found where I belong I finally found where I belong in your presence I finally found where I belong to be with you I finally found where I belong. I finally found where I belong. I finally found where I belong. We thank you, Jesus. I feel like the Lord's saying that this is what He chose. Yeah, come on. We're not stealing something from Him, a place in heaven. He chose that access. He died for that. The, the first thing that happened when He died on the cross was the veil was torn from top to bottom. Come on from the top to the bottom. That's not how something, it's a big curtain, big thick curtain. It didn't come from the bottom. We didn't tear the curtain, he did. He chose it. And so when we choose to join him in this, he's already there waiting for us. So we're not stealing something from him. We're not being selfish. We're not, we're actually claiming something that he wants for us. It's not, it's not stealing. I feel like there's like a feeling of like, I don't wanna steal your glory. It's like, no, I'm asking you to join me in it. So Jesus, we just choose to join you where, in the place that you've asked us to come. Lord, we thank you for the access. We recognize we didn't deserve it, but Lord, you're making it so that we get to walk into that. And Lord, we join you. Lord, we choose to join you right now. Yes, yes, yes. Lord, you knew our junk from the beginning. Yeah. We don't need to fix ourselves. Lord, you're inviting us through faith next to you. Lord, we finally found where we belong, but Lord, you've had that place set aside for a long time. Yeah. I finally found where I belong. Come on. I finally found where I belong. In your presence. I finally found where I belong. Just to be with you. Yes, come on. I finally found where I belong. I 
finally found where I belong I finally found where I belong Just to be with you Just to be with you I finally found where I belong Let's sink in I finally found where I belong Right by your side I finally found where I belong It's just to be with you Just to be with you oh. I finally found where I belong I finally found where I belong I finally found where I belong It's just to be with you Just to be with you Nothing else matters Nothing in this world will do Now that I have you Nothing else matters
salvation Your spirit alive in me It's life to declare your promise My soul now to stay oh, So what can I
I'm gonna read um, a passage to you guys out of Ephesians 2 and do my best to keep it together. This is what I think of when I sing this song. It says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and the mind by nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Do you remember that you? Do you remember that you before Jesus? I love this. This is verse four. But God, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. You've been raised up with him and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us who believe. Can you imagine what that is going to be like? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So what else can I say? What else can I do but offer all of me to him? What else can we do? This is the best thing ever. There is no other response than to give him our lives. He gave his for us when we were his enemy, when we were opposed to him. He came with his grace, with his mercy, with his love and completely transformed us. Nothing, there's nothing else to do but to give him everything. So Father, we come before you tonight and we give you everything to the best that we understand. To the best that we understand right now, we confess to you that we are yours. We are your children. We are your servants. We are your friends. All, 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 only because you are rich in mercy and you loved us and you pour your grace out on us. We will be a people of faith, not just in word, but in actions, because you have proven yourself time and time and time again. You are trustworthy for our future. So we give ourselves to you. We just confess right now, just in our own hearts, in our own minds, that we are yours. We are yours. And it's all because of you. It is all because of you, Jesus. And so this is why we sing. This is why we praise. This is why we lay our lives down because you're worthy. And so what else can we say? We love you. We love you so much.
Man, he's so good, right? He's so good, right? Amen. Amen. We're so glad to have you as a part of our online family today. We couldn't put on this experience without your generosity and support. If you'd like to partner with us as we continue to spread the gospel, there are two ways that you can give at Vertical Life. You can text any amount to 84321, or you can go to verticallife.info and click give. We believe that God has something awesome to teach us today, so let's prepare our hearts as we continue in our service with an awesome message. How are you guys doing? Doing well? Come on, I like the feedback. That's awesome. You guys are awake and alert. Well, hey, it's so good to, uh, to be back here, trying to get back in the saddle and things, uh, speaking once again. It was awesome to take a little bit of a speaking break. We have a fantastic team, do we not? Let's put our hands together. We have some great messages and so forth. If you didn't uh, catch any of it, I, I strongly encourage you to go to our YouTube channel, kind of follow up on it. It talks about our, our core values, uh, who we are, where we're headed, all that fun, fun stuff. Um, what we're going to do today is actually with a series. I don't know if it's just going to be a two-part series or if it's going to be a little bit longer than that. But uh, the series is called Friendship and Favor. And um, I think there's a lot of times key principles uh, in the kingdom. And when I say kingdom, I re I'm referring to Christianity. I'm referring to God's way of doing things, you know. And so it's God's way of doing things, his ad administration, his rule, his reign, all, all those things. And I think a lot of times what we do in the Western Christianity is we settle for uh, salvation. We're okay with God taking care of our eternity, but we want to keep our now to ourselves, like you can, I'll give you my tomorrow, Lord, in the sense of my eternity, and you can have my yesterday in the sense of all my mistakes and my failures, but right now, the, the now moment, that's for me. You know, so we live in this false sense of surrender to him when in reality we're not surrendered to him. He's just gracious enough to, to save us, and, and we just give him our eternity. Do you follow me? And so what I want to do is unpack a couple principles, things that I've been kind of wrestling with for a couple years now. And I think they're, they're key factors that can help you dramatically in your life. Maybe not the way that you think, uh, but I think they can have great influence in your life. And one of those principles is growing in favor with God. How many people you would say, you know what, I would love to grow in favor with the Lord. I want to grow in it. And, and this is the confusing part about it because we falsely assume that love and favor is the same thing. Did you hear me? Love and favor is not the same thing. You, God will never love you more than he loves you right now. You know, I've been, I've been playing around with cryptocurrency. Anyone? Um, it's, it's kind of scary, frightening, not sure what to think about it. And when I say playing around with it, I mean like, like $15, okay? So it's just like this, I'm, I'm hoping my $15 is going to turn into like $200,000, you know? I'm one of those guys. And so uh, I'm playing around with it. And what's kind of frustrating is just this up and down constantly, not by the day, not by the hour, but by the second. It's just like this. It's just up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And I think sometimes we believe that's how God's love is towards us. Up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. It's not like that at all. Like when you were at your worst moment, he's so gracious, so loving that he said, I want you. I choose you. That moment that you don't share with anyone, the one that you hide, the one that you don't even want to think about yourself, you don't even tell your therapist, that, that moment, that dark, deep, dark secret, he was there in that moment. And he looked at you and said, I want you. I love you. There's nothing, absolutely nothing that you can do to change his love and how he feels about you. So you, his love for you right now will never change. It'll never be less. It'll never be greater. However, when it comes to favor, that is something that you and I can definitely grow in. In fact, if you look at, if you want, you can look at Luke chapter 2, verse 52. It says here, it's referring to Jesus. And I'm going to use this passage to kind of kick this off with giving you an understanding that you can grow in favor. And it says here, it says, and Jesus increased in what? He increased in wisdom. He increased in stature. And in what, what else? What is it? Favor. favor with who? 
God and man. So you're telling me that Jesus, the Son of God, actually had to grow in favor with his Father. I am saying that. And that you and I have an opportunity to grow in our favor, in favor with him. All of us have that opportunity. And so what I want to do is really want to challenge you with that concept and provide you a couple things to, for you to kind of embrace and to realize that you can not only grow in favor, but help you to understand how you can grow in favor. And so if you're writing, take notes, when it comes down to favor, you know, I just jot down a few thoughts regarding favor. But favor is having God working on your behalf. God doing in your life, what only God can do. It's a divine intervention. You could also say it like this. This might be the best way to put it. Is God working in and through you to accomplish his purposes? Like he's, he's choosing you. You know, there's this passage that always stood out to me. It's in 2 Chronicles. And, and what it says, it says that his spirit is searching, is seeking throughout the earth for what? For someone that he can show himself mightily through. And what was the qualifier for that? It, it didn't say that he was looking for someone that he could love. It was looking for someone in a way you could say show his favor, who he could, he could work through. And what was the qualifier? The qualifier is that they were completely committed and submitted to him. And in reality, they were an empty vessel ready and willing to be used by God. And that's what God's looking for is he's looking for vessels. He's looking for people that will walk with him, that he can show his favor upon their life. And I don't know about you, but I want to be one of those individuals. Anyone else in here? Anyone else in here that would like to increase and see more favor in your life? You can say, nah, Jeremy, I just prefer to do it on my own. I don't know about you, but I, I want favor. And see, this is, this is a tricky thing because a lot of times when you say, when you, especially in a Western format, when you refer to favor, sometimes, not with everyone, but your mind can be tempted to go into this realm of a prosperity type of message. Right? And, th and that's what's dangerous. When you take the attributes or characteristics of the kingdom and separate them from the relationship with the king, you always go off in error. And you can't deny the fact that there's favor in relationship with God. You can't deny the fact that there's also persecution in, when, in relationship with God. And so what I strongly encourage people, because I, I think there's these camps where some people want to land over, all right, it's all about persecution and poverty. And then some people, it's like, no, if you're right with God, it's all about prosperity and favor. You know, that's kind of like the, the two different sides. I don't think you should pursue either one of those things. I think in reality, you pursue him. You pursue Jesus. You pursue him and his kingdom. And the result of that is favor. The result of that may be persecution. Just because you have favor from God doesn't mean it's going to go well in your eyes or how you have it planned out in your life. For example, Mary, the mother of Jesus, she found favor in God's eyes. I would say that it was a very uncomfortable season for her. Being a virgin and trying to explain to everybody, including your husband, that she didn't lay with anyone, that what was happening in her life was actually an act of God. That's favor. So when I say favor, I'm not just referring to like what you might be thinking about, just this prosperity way of life. I'm talking about you being an empty vessel and that God works in you and through you and through your life. That's what I want. I want to be an empty vessel that God works through and in. And so the question is, how? How, how do we grow in favor? Like, if we can increase in favor... What I want to know is how do I grow in favor? How, how do I increase in that in my life? And so I'm going to, I'm going to use this analogy. And it, they're going to put a picture, this 
behind me. And the way, the way I'm going to try to communicate it to, today, I'm, I'm going to oversimplify some things. And I'm not saying this is an exhaustive list or anything like that. I'm going to oversimplify it to give you handles that you can grab a hold of and say, you know what, Jeremy, I can apply this to my life and learn to walk and grow in favor. And so you can look at it like this, like two legs is what I'm going to use in that you're going to walk in favor and grow in favor with the Lord. So there's two legs, right? It takes two legs to walk. Would you agree with me? All right, guys. Does it take two legs to walk? All right. Okay. So the first thing that we need in our life is what I'm going to call pursuit. All right. And that's this right here. Now, there's different areas that you and I are called to be in pursuit of. All right. And these are the three areas right here. The first one is pursuit of his face. And what I mean by that is fellowship and communion with him. Like, are you in relationship with him? Are you actually pursuing him, who he is? A lot of times we pursue only what's in his hands, what he can do and give us. What's going to sustain you is relationship with him. Like the trials in my life, some of the difficulties that I've faced in my life, whether it was loss of loved ones and things like that. Listen, it wasn't, it wasn't really what was in his hand that kept me. It was him himself. It was a relationship with him. Once you know him in that way, everything else in society, everything in the culture pales in comparison. I'm not saying it's not no longer pleasurable, but I'm saying it's inferior because you've tasted of something greater. You know, there's a passage in Song of Solomon where it says that it, your love is better, it's greater than wine. Now, what they're saying, they're not saying that wine's not good. Wine's referred to a lot of good things in Scripture. He, what, what he's saying is that your love makes wine an inferior pleasure. And so what's happened, and we're trying to say no to so many things in this world we're trying to say no to so many things that we're tempted by in our own strength, in our own effort. But if you are in relationship with him, it's going to be so much easier to say no to those things because you've tasted of something that's superior. Do you hear me? And so what happens is not lo no longer a focus on abstaining from things, but it's a focus of I'm pursuing someone. Like with my wife, it's not, it's not, I, I don't not sleep around. Maybe I'm getting a little, uh, maybe too loose in my conversation with you. But it's, I don't go to sleep around with other ladies because I'm trying to be good. I don't do it because I love her. I'm telling you, when you enter in relationship with him in this way, when you're pursuing him and his face, it changes everything for you. And that's one big thing that we're about here in this culture is we're going to drive you to him. We don't want you being obedient to our voice. We want you to be obedient to his voice. We want you to know him. Amen. So that's one thing that you got to ask yourself in your, in your, in, in your, you can take notes and stuff and say, hey, am I pursuing him? Am, am I in communion? Am I in relationship with him? Am I seeking his face? The second thing is his, his heart. And when I say his heart, it's the things that he cares about. It's his mission. It's what he's trying to do around, this, around you in your life right now, in the world. Are you doing anything about the things that he cares about? Like, are you doing anything about, about the unsaved people around you? Are you doing anything about trying to advance his kingdom? Are you doing anything about trying to make disciples? Are you doing anything about trying to find the people that he wants to be in relationship with? In Corinthians, it says that his spirit is crying out, that he wants people to be reconciled to him. And you and I are those vessels to do that. Are you linking up? Are you pursuing his heart for the relationships, the people, the culture, the neighborhood, the city, the lost people of this world around you? Or are you just kind of like, ah? Are you pursuing his heart? Listen, this, once again, I want to constantly reiterate this. This has nothing to do with God loving you. This has everything to do with you growing and walking in favor with him. Are you pursuing his heart? The third thing is his kingdom. 
Are you pursuing his kingdom? And when, when I use this, what I want you to kind of understand is when I say his kingdom in this part, in the, referring to this section, I'm referring to his administration and his way of doing things. Because what happens sometimes, I can be guilty of this, like I will want to do it my way, not his way. Like it's a very realistic and practical way to discuss this in today's culture is relationships with a man and a woman. What happens is they say, you know what, we'll do it our way. And because we love each other, even though we're not in a covenant marriage with one another, we'll do it our way. And we'll go ahead and say it's okay to sleep with one another because we have plans of getting married and we love each other. Are you pursuing his kingdom? Are you pursuing his way of doing things? his standards. If you want to grow in favor with the Lord, you have to also pursue his kingdom. So that's one leg, pursuit. All right. The second leg is what we're going to kind of lean into today. And that's what the Lord in a lot of ways has been kind of dealing with my heart for, I would say, a couple of years now. And it's stewardship. It's pursuit and it's stewardship. And what happens is that you have to have both of these legs to be able to, to walk in a straight line or to go somewhere. And I don't know about you, but have you ever felt like you're just walking in circles spiritually? Like you're just kind of like, you feel like sometimes you're not going anywhere. You're like, God, do you even hear me? Do you know my name? Do you know that I exist? Do you know, are you a follower on my Instagram page? Do you know who I am? Anyone? Okay, I guess you guys are all holy because... Maybe you, got, you guys, I don't even think they need this message, Chris. I think, that, I think they all are walking in great favor with the Lord. There's moments where I'm like, God, where in the world are you? And you feel like you're spiritually just walking in circles. And what I would say is that the frustration that you're feeling in your life is because you're really good at one of these and poor at the other. And so what happens is instead of the legs working in tandem with each other, let's say you're really good at pursuit. You're very good about pursuing the things of the kingdom. You're very good about pursuing his heart. You're in great relationship with him and you do it his way. And so, but this is still you. You're just walking because you fail to steward the things that he's given you. And there's some of you, you're really good at stewarding the resources. And when I say resources, I'm not referring to only finances. I'm referring to relationships, people, opportunities, prophetic words spoken over your life, all these different things. We'll get into it here in a moment. But you're, you're really good at that, but you have no care or concern for his kingdom. And so what do you do? You're just in, you're walking in circles. It takes you intentionally in pursuit of him and intentionally stewarding what he has given you to begin to walk. And when you do that, I'm telling you, just give it a try. You're going to grow in favor with the Lord. You're going to grow with favor in the Lord. So if you're taking notes, this is what I want, to, I want you to write this down. I want you to ask yourself this question. You can write down a piece of paper. You can jot it down. In fact, I'm going to encourage you to write this down. I want you to actually take it before the Lord, and I want you to ask yourself this and take it to him. Allow the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you, and it's this. Can God trust me? Because we're talking about resources. Can God trust me with his resources? It's coming. I'm referring to finances. I'm referring to relationships. I'm referring to, to opportunities. And then below that, you can write this next question. Why should God give me more if my stewardship is poor? Sound like Dr. Seuss. But. Why should God give me more if my stewardship is poor? And this is, we got to be honest with ourselves. There comes a moment that you got to look in the mirror and stop blaming God and ask yourself hard questions and just be honest with where you're at in your life. Like I, I've shared this story before. I think it's a great analogy. I think about it a lot of times when I see this piece of equipment in the gym. And I remember I was at the Y. And you know that gym at the Y, that pull-up bar? And it has this like, like little flapper thing. This thing. I don't even know what it's called. It's just like a step that flaps down. And you can pick a different weight to kind of like help you out to get you to get a pull-up. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? 
don't, yeah, don't pretend you don't know what I'm talking about. So like I look at that machine and, and, and what's horrible about it is it's the highest thing in the whole room. So everyone can see you. And so I remember I'm over there. I'm like, I, I'm not really great at pull-ups. You know, I'm just not great at it. I don't really care for them, but I wanted to increase in pull-ups. And I remember I was at the YMCA and there that thing is in the center of everything. And I swear they make it a little bit higher on purpose. You know, just a little bit more in person, just, just to embarrass you. So I go over there and I, I pull out a couple of pull-ups, probably about 200 of them. Not really. So I got to a point where I was like, John, come on, man. You know I'm telling the truth, right? So I, I, uh, I was pull, doing some pull-ups. And what I realized is like, okay, I can't go any further after like one. Not really. But I was like, I need some help. And then there was this moment where I was like, hmm. I look at that thing. I'm like, this is so embarrassing. No. Ah, no. And so you flap that thing down. You pick a weight. And you start to swallow your pride. And look around, make sure no one's looking. And I always, when I get down, I I put that thing back up. Because maybe they didn't see it. But this is the truth. Until I admit where I'm at, I can never grow. If you don't admit where you're at, if you're not honest with yourself, you will not grow. You'll miss the mark every time. So this has nothing to do with condemnation, has nothing to do with beating you up. This is us loving you and saying that there's more available, there's kingdom principles that you need to learn to apply to your life. And one of them is walking in favor. And so the thing is that we have to understand is that we want, often we want advancement beyond our level of faithfulness or we want promotion beyond our level of stewardship. And God will not promote me. You can write this down. God will not promote me beyond my level of faithfulness. It's an honest and hard truth. I think a lot of us, we see there's this, there's this frustration in our life and we see this lack of progression and we're saying, what is happening? And I'm here telling you the answer is because you're not faithfully stewarding what he has given you. That's one po- very strong possibility. And so you ask yourself this question, have I been faithful in my current season? Because often we want to advance into a new season when we haven't been faithful in our current season? Like, are you faithful in your current season? A few questions you can just kind of ponder. Have I been faithful with the relationships that God has given me? Have I been faithful with the finances that God has entrusted me with? Have I been faithful with my calling that God has given me? Have I been faithful in a good steward of my time? Have I been faithful with the revelation that God has given me? When I say revelation, I'm saying, you know, when God highlights something in your life, gives you revelation, and it calls you to walk and live that out, but you don't, and you ask for God to give you a new revelation, a new direction, why should he give you anything new if you didn't listen to the last thing that he told you? Like, it's kind of funny because a lot of times we want God to speak to us. God, speak to me, speak to me, speak to me. And you pay no attention to this right here. You want him to give you an audible word when you won't even obey his written word. Apply this to your life. Obey the written word if you want to hear him speak to you. Now, so, you know, it says Jesus grew in favor because he was faithful with the season that he was in. And so what we got to understand is that we have we have to learn to steward what God has given us well, because there, I, I strong I strongly believe that there's not going to be any progression in our life. And that will actually limit or cap our potential if we're if we're not properly stewarding the things that God has given us. Because a lot of times, I don't know about you, but I'm guilty of this. I want promotion beyond my level of maturity. I'm gonna let that sit for a second. We want promotion beyond our level of maturity. And God won't give it to you because he loves you. Because it will kill you, it will destroy you. 
Like I'm even cautious about letting certain people speak here because I know a lot of times that when you step out to declare the gospel in certain ways or, or, or taking a step forward in the kingdom, what happens is it, it, it can just open up new battles in your life spiritually. And so sometimes your lack of progression is because of your immaturity and it's because Jesus is just, he's trying to love you. In fact, you can write this down. You can look at 1 Timothy 3, 6, where there's a principle there about not promoting people who are young in their faith in case the devil comes in and takes them out. And so you might be frustrated with God. God, like, why, why is there not more? I want more. I want more. I want more. Like, just more of you. I want, I want something. And so when I say promotion, that's what I mean. Like, more of you, more favor, more of this, whatever it is. And it's not that he's, den- it's not that he's saying no. He's just saying not yet because he's maturing you, because he's loving you. God will mature me before he promotes me. And so I really want you to see this kingdom principle of of stewardship. And I believe, honestly, it's one of the first gifts that God ever gave mankind was stewardship. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. You can turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to what? Work it. And what? Keep it. And so what we see here is that God placed Adam in the garden and entrusted him with a responsibility to bring out the garden's best by being faithful to work it. That is called stewardship. So the first gift, one of the first gifts that God gave mankind is the responsibility to steward well. And so you can write this down for stewardship. It'll it'll be up here. Stewardship is this, the delegated responsibility and authority. A lot of times we just want the authority, not the responsibility. The delegated responsibility and authority to manage someone's resources to its fullest potential. And in the same way, you've been entrusted with something by God, and God is expecting you to bring it to its fullest potential. And so you got to ask yourself this question. How well am I working the garden that God has given me in my life? So I really, I mean, I, I really want to drive this home for you, this concept of stewardship, because I do believe it's an overlooked principle in the kingdom of God. And I believe that there's some people here and people watching online, whether it's this Sunday or later on, anytime, that there's an internal frustration, frustration in your life. And a lot of it may have to do with this simple fact that you're failing to steward the things that God has given you. Now look at this passage. You can write these down. I'm going to kind of go through them real fast. It's 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11. What I want to do is I want to show you the gift, the resource, and then I want to show you the responsibility for stewardship. Okay? Are you with me? All right. It says, as each has received what? A gift. All right? So there's a resource. Use it to serve one another as what? Good stewards. There's a responsibility of God's varied grace. All right, I'm not going to read the rest of the passage. Let's move on to the next one. Luke 16, 10 through 12 says this. One who is what? Faithful. There's a responsibility in a very little. The gift is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? You, you see that they're faithful, like faith, being faithful and being a good steward. Matthew 21, 43. Therefore, I tell you, the what? The kingdom of God, right? So there's the resource, the gift, will be taken away from you and given to people, what? Producing the responsibility, the stewardship, its fruits, Listen, God wants us to be fruitful. I'm pretty convinced. I, I, I may be wrong in this. This is, this is a side note coming from me. But I'm pretty convinced that the Satan doesn't care that you're a Christian. He just doesn't want you to be a fruitful Christian. 
And you'll notice from Genesis throughout the scripture, God is constantly giving people responsibilities and asking you to be fruitful and to be a good steward of it. In fact, it's the great mandate in the beginning, be fruitful and multiply. You're going to see this. So the devil is always going to attack you in the area of being fruitful, in the area of stewardship. Like God loves you. He he loves you, but if you're unwilling to submit your ways to him and become an empty vessel, he can't use you. So here it is. I want, I want you to look at this, this parable. This, it's in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. You can write it down. You can follow with us along right here. It says, for it. Now, when he says it, you got to understand what he's referring to. He's referring to the kingdom. Like one thing that's missing so much in Western Christianity is the, the concept that it's the gospel of the kingdom, and we limit to just the gospel of salvation. And so what happens is that our progression always stops once you, get your, once you are baptized and you get your T-shirt, right? I got baptized. I got dunked. I got whatever. I mean, maybe sprinkled in some places, but, you know, and you got your T-shirt, and, we, and it, it stops there, right? It's done. And it's the gospel of the kingdom. So you got to understand, Jesus was speaking about the kingdom. All right? So here, what he's talking about is the kingdom. So for it, what? The kingdom. Everyone say kingdom. Kingdom. Will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and what? There it is. Entrusted. That's the responsibility to them. What? His property. There's the gift. All right. There's the resource. I want to pound the stewardship home because I I believe this can radically change some people's lives if you learn to steward things well. All right. It says to one, he gave five talents to another two, to another one to each according to his ability. Now, I'm going to stop there for a second because this is the thing. Well, how come this person got two, this person got five and so forth? Immediately what we do is we question our value, our worth. See, what we're doing is we're looking at kingdom principles with worldly eyes. This has nothing to do with your value. Whether you have 10 talents or one talent, 100 talents or no talents, you are just as valuable to Jesus. Did you hear me? Just because my wife's over here singing, and as beautiful as it is, and as like she just kicks you in the face as it is, it's just as valuable as someone that's saying hello to someone walking in the door. It's just as valuable as someone who's at home watching online right now, raising their babies to love Jesus. It's, this is not a value thing, all right? So we got to get that mindset out of it. So I wanted to say that. Then we, let's continue on. It says, then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also, he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and did what? He hid his master's money. Now you got to notice here the emphasis. What, what, what Jesus is emphasizing here is not the amount. He's not emphasizing the amount of money or talent. He's emphasizing the stewardship in their lives of what they were given. Do you see it? Let's continue. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. And his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Why? You have been what? Faithful over a little. I will set you up over much. What just happened? Increase of favor. There was a promotion. Enter into the joy of my master. Right there. He was promoted. He received favor. Why? Because he stewarded well. Verse 22, and he also had, who had the two talents came forward saying, master, you delivered to me two talents here. I've made two talents more. And his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Once again, what we see here is that stewardship 
is being rewarded. He, there's an increase of favor. Verse 24, he also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man. Like reaping, notice what he, I, I think it's just a kicker what he says. And I'll explain here in a second, but pay, pay, pay close attention. Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. That's not what he wanted. He expected fruit. And that's what's happening in some of our lives. We're just going to hand God back what he has already given us. That's not what he wants. He's looking for partners. He's looking for empty vessels. He's looking for people who will walk with responsibility and steward and be fruitful with anything that he's given you. So I have a question for some of you husbands because I'm a husband. God's given you a beautiful wife. When you give, him back, give her back to the Lord, did she blossom under your care? Is she fulfilling the purpose and the calling on her life because you will be held accountable for it because God trusted you with her life. Parents, same thing with your kids. What has God given you and you think you're just going to give it back to him with not, no return, no fruitfulness at all? You're missing a very important concept in the kingdom, and that's God's expectation that you steward things well and that you are fruitful. Why? Because the definition of stewardship is what? The delegated responsibility and authority. So he, he, he not only gives you the responsibility, he gives you the authority to manage someone's resources to its fullest potential. Verse 26. But his master answered him, said, you, what, wicked and slothful servant. What's interesting about that, that word slothful is it actually means, it does mean lazy, but also means hesitant and reluctant. Like how many times are we hesitant about the things of the kingdom? Reluctant about the things of the kingdom. But we're so aggressive about the things of this world. It's like, I just pray, Holy Spirit, like, just give us eyes to see your kingdom. Like, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Matthew 13, 44 is kind of like a highlighted verse in my life right now because it was someone who saw the kingdom and sold, sold everything that he had in joy and went and bought that field where the treasure was, and that treasure was the kingdom. And I pray that we all and those watching will have those same eyes to see the kingdom that we wouldn't have to be slothful or reluctant, but we'll be like, God, you can have everything, everything. And I'm not saying, when I say sell everything, I'm not saying, okay, you go empty your cryptocurrency account <laughs> if you want to go for it, but if it's Dogecoin, you better sell and get out now. <laughs> but if, I'm not saying things like that. What I'm saying is that when you, when you sell out, it's, you're handing it to God and it says with an open hand, you can do with it what you want that you live with an open hand before him. It continues here and it says, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I scattered no seed. I mean, that's, that's, think about that. He's saying, look, look what he says, you knew. So you had a revelation. You had an understanding that I do the impossible. Look, that's what he said, right? You knew, everyone said knew, that I reap where I have not sown and I gather where I scatter no seed. So that I, he's saying I can do the impossible, but yet you were still slothful and lazy and reluctant. And anyone that does not see the kingdom of God for what it is, that's what happens in your life. But once you see it, once you begin to see, I'm not saying it's like, all right, you're, you're, you're going to be this radical, crazy, bold person all at once. But what you'll begin to see is you're just not as reluctant as you were. There's a, a boldness that begins to come over you. You're like, his kingdom and his way is worth all of it. Do you hear me? In verse 27, he said, then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with what? Why? Because he wants you to be what? Fruitful. 
He said, you could at least stuck it in the bank. That would have been a better stewardship. Make 0.1%. That would have been better than what you did. It was an insult to me. You, you like, how, if you think about it, I'm, not, I'm processing this actually right in front of you right now. Like, I can't hit pause and come back. But I want to I wanna walk with you or ask you to walk with me on this journey for a second. Like, how, I mean, how insulting is it to him? How much does it say that we don't trust him, we don't think he's able? When we live coward, cautious, passive lives. Not knowing that he's more than willing, more than able. And not only this, like, let's say it doesn't go your way. Because, you know, we always talk about heroes of faith and, you know, Hebrews 11, you know, the heroes of faith. I was actually sitting with a guy one time and we were talking about the heroes of faith. And I said, have you ever read that, all of that? I was like, get out your phone. Let's read it. So he started reading it. And at first it's like, you know, they conquered kingdoms. They did all these things. They're, the dead was raised. And you're like, yeah. Like, sing it, Nicole. That's awesome. Let's do it. And then it continues on. And it's like, and they were sawn in two. They roamed in the caves. And then it's like this other side, but they were heroes of faith as well. And what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that just because you're bold and forward with the kingdom, I'm not saying it's going to go as you please, but I promise you this, the reward is going to be well worth it. And when you have that confidence, you can walk with that kind of boldness. And so we, we, we have to understand that we have a responsibility to steward the things that God has given us. And some of your frustration, I'll say it again, may very well be the result of poorly stewarding the things that God has given you. I want to read this quote. It says, I believe the failure to understand and pursue the journey of stewarding the favor of God has led so many people to die in the unnecessary tragedy of never having their God-given dreams and desires fulfilled. While God loves everyone the same, not everyone has the same measure of favor. Yet everyone's position to increase in favor if each one of us effectively stewards what we have. Are you a good steward of the things that God has given you? So real quick, I'm going to give you five areas I think is very practical that you can begin to steward in your life. The first one is this. You're going to pull up the diagram behind me. The first one is this. It's, it's your time. How well do you steward the time that God has given you? Once again, this is not an exhaustive list. I'm just going to give you some things that you can kind of practice and implement in your life. And I think some some people's lives, they're out of control. You have no peace. You're overwhelmed. Your hearts are filled with anxiety. There's nothing spirit and there's nothing spiritual about it. You keep blaming the devil. In reality, it's your lack of stewardship of time. It's not the devil. If, you, if, you, if you're not careful and begin to learn how to steward your time, then crisis and chaos will steward you. Do you hear me? Psalms 90 verse 12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. And that number means you assign. You don't just count it. You assign, assign it to something. Kind of like, have, has anyone ever heard the zero budget system, the zero dollar budget system? Basically, that you leave no, nothing in your account. You assign each dollar, each penny to a specific task. And what he's saying here is that when you do this, when you begin to take your time and you assign it to specific things, then what happens is that you actually begin to gain a heart of wisdom in your life. So that's the first area is uh, time, stewarding time. The second thing is relationships. How well am I stewarding the relationships that God has given me? Like God, I feel like the spirit in this season, probably because I've been disobedient, to be honest with you, probably for maybe a year or so, is that I, I have a hard time sometimes making sure that I steward relationships well. And I'm not talking about like, People in my life right now, I'm talking about the people that God keeps trying to bring into my life. Because I'll tell you this, I'm a very skeptical, cautious, mm, we'll see type of person. Anyone else like that? And I feel like, like, like sometimes I pray like God bring people in my life. 
and he brings them in my life, but I fail to steward it well, and I don't gain what I should have gained from the relationship. Anyone else? And so you gotta ask yourself the question, are you stewarding the relationships that God's placed in your life well? And there's a few relationships I wanna challenge you with. Worship team, you can uh, begin to make your way up here. So I wanna challenge you in in a, a few specific areas to make sure you're stewarding these things well. One is your marriage. Like, you're, how well are you stewarding that relationship? I promise you this, there's someone else that would be more than glad to have your spouse. Steward your relationships well. Family, how well are you stewarding your family? You know, what's weird about the, the Western culture versus the Hebrew culture, in the Western culture, we're very isolated and individualistic in our, our approach to things. It's kind of like, how quickly can we get you out of the house? And you're like, how quickly can I get out of the house? And, and it's this idea of like, I want to become my own person, my own individual. In the Hebrew culture, what, how, how it's done is that you're more of a unit. And so actually the patriarch and the matriarch, especially the father, takes so much pride in the, in the, the perception, the progress, the, the, the family units. Like it's actually their pride. Whereas in American culture, a lot of times our pride with men is in our jobs, how much money we're making and all those things. Whereas in the Hebrew culture, your pride is actually in your family, your kids. So yet I'm gonna ask you, how well are you stewarding your family? The second thing is, or third thing is friends. Another one is discipleship. God's placing people in your life. Are you discipling them well? Last one is spiritual fathers and mothers. Sometimes we cry out, God, send me a spiritual father. Send me a spiritual mother. And he does. And since you're so wounded or hurt, it's difficult to trust. And what happens is you don't steward it well and get the fruit from it that you could. The next one is finances. Can God trust you with his resources? One is obviously generosity. Are you a generous person? You know, this is something that I'm going after in my life is generosity. I got some cash for Christmas. Yes, you know, got some cash for Christmas and I was just stuck it on my shelf in my closet. And I was like, I just want want to wait for the opportunity. There's some things I want. Like I really want the, I I wouldn't mind having the um, stag fellow, like it's like a, a, a coffee kettle. It's like really nice. You can set the temperature. It's like matte black too. And you can get these like really cool wood handles on them. It makes it, makes it pop real well. Anyways, um, so I, like I would love to, love to have bought that or something. Um, but I was like, I wanna, I, wanna be, I wanna steward finance as well. I wanna be a generous person. And so I just waited. An opportunity came and for me to give. And it felt so good. Like, can God trust you with his resources? The other thing is tithing. Tithing, listen, is a kingdom principle. Just like Sabbath is a principle, that's a blessing in it. If you practice Sabbath, tithing is a principle. Is it a binding obligation? No. But is it an invitation, a calling, a principle for blessing? Absolutely. There's people in here right now that you have stories where once you started giving to his house and to the kingdom, things changed. Sometimes we get high on our horse and we think it's us. And then we're like, I'll keep my money. Then who knows what will happen after that. But but I'm telling you, it's it's a principle. Is it an obligation? No, but is it a kingdom principle that has blessings attached to it? Absolutely. Just like the Sabbath, if you practice Sabbath, if you practice rest, is it something that you have to do, you're obligated to do? No, but will it bring blessing and be beneficial to your life? Absolutely. Exact same thing with tithing. You're robbing yourself. Genesis 12, 2, and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. So I'll bless you, I'll give you a gift so that you can be a blessing stewardship. Next one is gifting. God's given some people in here, everyone in here gifts. The question is, are you using those well? Are you using those to advance his kingdom? First Peter 4.10, you can just write this down real fast. It says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. The last one is uh, prophetic words. 
This one's kind of interest, interesting to me. I grew up in a very charismatic culture. Anyone else? No, just me. Okay, uh, just me. Anybody else? All right, thank you. There's a few people. Words spoken over people's lives and things like that. Sometimes you're not sure what to think. You're not sure what to do. And I understand. You should always, always bring it to uh, to to see counsel and make sure it's solid and sound. But what I've noticed sometimes is that people think that just because a word has been spoken over their life, that it's just going to happen. Like, I'm going to speak a prophetic word of your life, and you just do it. It's, it's not the case. You have a responsibility to steward that word well. And if you don't steward it well, it will not come to fruition. Listen, look at this passage in 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 19. It says, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child. Paul's writing to Timothy. He's saying, in accordance with what? The prophecies previously made about you that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith in a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. So what he's saying here is that Timothy's progression and what kept him was him stewarding the word of God, the prophetic word spoken over his life well, and what shipwrecked the others is that they neglected it. How well are you stewarding the words that God has spoken of your life through other individuals? And once again, I'm going to be very clear. Not every word that someone speaks over you is the Lord. Did you hear me? Not every word that speak, someone speaks over you, whether it's from me or anyone else, you have a responsibility to make sure it is the Lord. And pray about it and take it to some wise counsel but you have a responsibility to restore it well. Let's stand up. Listen, I believe once again, I believe strongly that the Spirit of God is searching for vessels, empty vessels that He can pour Himself into, looking for people that will grow in favor, people who are pursuing His face, fellowship with Him, people who are pursuing His heart, what He's about, people who are pursuing His kingdom, His way of doing things, and people who are actually stewarding the things that He's given them now well. I want that to be me. Anyone else? I want that to be me. Come on, every hand in this place, I just want to pray over you as the worship team starts and the prayer team comes forward here in a second. Holy Spirit, I just thank you in this place, Lord, that you just give us revelation and insight into the principles of your kingdom, especially and growing in favor. And Holy Spirit, I thank you for a fresh wind to blow in our hearts. I thank you for your strength, your encouragement, your joy. I thank you, Father, that there, you know what? Actually, I thank you right now for joy in every home, in every heart, in every relationship, in every family member. If you're watching online right now, I speak joy of your home. I speak favor. I thank you, God, that we are a people, we are a church. As a pastor of this church, I want to say we're a church that desires to grow in favor with you. And we thank you for that truth, God. We thank you for that principle. And we thank you for that invitation to follow you well. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all say amen. Prayer team, you can come down. Um, if you want prayer for anything, there's people that were more than willing and would love to pray with you. You are also free to go. If you want to go, go ahead. You can head out. If you want to chit chat with someone, feel free to do that. We kind of like to hang out for a little bit and just pray for people and, and kind of rest in His presence a little bit. So if you want to hang out, you're more than welcome. But if you need to go or if you just want to go, grab, hit up Sonic before it closes. Go for it. We love you guys. Come, let us sing to the Lord. And come, let bow down before him his banner is love over us his mercies are new every morning so I sing oh, oh, oh. oh and so we lift you high forever lift you high high within our hearts high within our minds it's Jesus you alone our rock our cornerstone high within our hearts high within our minds so come come let us sing the Lord let us bow come let us bow
everything that's in me will bless his holy name. Everything that's in me will bless his holy name. for joining us today. We hope that today's service was an encouragement and a blessing to you, and we would love for you to share it with your friends and family. If you have any prayer requests, testimonies, or anything you'd like to share, send us an email at hello at verticallife.church or reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. We hope you guys have an awesome week. See you next time.